Thanks for tuning in to the Pace Performance Podcast so this afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome for a long overdue podcast, Joe Club. So welcome to the podcast, Joe. Thank you for having me, Rob. It's an absolute pleasure. It's We just mentioned it just then. It's been a long time coming. Apologies for, I pray out in my diary every six months, just drop Joe <laughs> a message. Is she all right? Does she want to come on? So I'm, I'm delighted to get you on. So thank you very much for giving up your time. Anyone that doesn't know who you are, just want to give us a bit of an intro on you, uh, what you've done previously, and most importantly, and very exciting, what you're doing now. Yeah, so I have been a sports scientist for um, over a decade now. I graduated from Loughborough University and went to do an internship with Chelsea Football Club, which then snowballed into a full-time role and I ended up staying there for six years or so. Um, from there, I went on to Brighton and Hove Albion and also did a online distance learning master's with ACU at that time. And then started having a few discussions around some opportunities in America. And so I actually, in 2015, went out to the States to work in Buffalo. Initially, I worked in the NHL in ice hockey for the Sabres um, and then moved across to the Buffalo Bills, which is the American football team um, and had five and a half uh, adventurous, amazing years uh, living stateside and now have returned to the homeland and um, I'm working as a performance science consultant. Nice, excellent. So where did you start off when you were were in England? You started off at Chelsea? Yeah, so I was an intern um, initially. So that was 2000 and around 2009, Chelsea had an internship program set up with Loughborough University. So that was the connection and each year a few um, students were selected to go and interview um, and I was offered uh, an internship in the 9-10 season, which was actually the double winning season under Carlo Ancelotti. So as far as a a first year uh, introduction into the applied setting, you you can't really get much better than that working under um, a manager like that and um, at the time, uh, Nick Broad, who I think you're aware of, was head of sports science. Um, and it was just such a um, forward thinking team, especially in those days was kind of the early days of sports science and technology being integrated into the Premier League. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was quite the pinnacle for a first year internship. So that was with the first team? It was with the first team, yes, and um, over my time with Chelsea, so about five or six seasons in total, um, and I was with the first team for the first few years, and then with management changes um, and different coaching philosophies coming and going at the club, a um, few years into it, I then started doing getting more involved in the academy setup, um, which was again, another fantastic learning experience um, to try and go from learning at the elite level where performance and winning matters every game you play, then to learning about youth development and actually sometimes, although it gets blended at the high levels of the academy where you're you're focusing on youth development, but also winning um, and trying to understand how as a practitioner I needed to shift my mindset and um, my approach to the job based on the differing age groups and what the the children needed i'm interested to to hear the the, bit more about the the differences and maybe the similarities between the two because i think people often have the um the ambition to get straight into the first team Mm. and i think sometimes there can be so much gain from having that long-term view been in an academy and then making the step up in the in the future should the opportunity arise so really interested to hear you doing it the opposite way yeah yeah i think it was a blessing in disguise really because obviously i'd had such amazing i've been thrust into such a successful first team environment quite early on and then because of particular coaching philosophies, not necessarily buying into the same setup in terms of sports science and medicine. Um, 
Neil Bath, the academy manager at Chelsea, gave me the opportunity to come and work there. And again, I had to set aside my assumptions, which as we'll get onto with working then in other sports is a really important lesson because uh, things you take for granted, um, you have to you have to rethink it. So for instance, because it's not necessarily about you'd like to win, but it's more about developing these youngsters to try and progress them and become the best players that they can potentially be. So for instance, perhaps a player would benefit, who's a right-footed player, might benefit from playing on the left wing, even though that might decrease the chance of the team winning. But because it's about developing them as an individual, that takes precedence. But then I think as well, experiencing that within the Chelsea Academy, which is a phenomenal setup. And, you know, from my biased opinion, was way ahead of the game in terms of trying to have an interdisciplinary approach to youth development very early on, um, even prior to the EPPP, setting up systems and processes whereby age group staff, one from every department or discipline would meet weekly. There would be a structure in terms of reviewing players, what are their action points, and, and then making sure that that's delegated to whoever the specialists are, and everyone's collaborating to try and develop every single player on the team. What was, what was the sports science support like in 2009? I mean, I, was a, I got a little bit of an insight into it at a much lower level a, little, a few years after that, but what was it like in 2009? What, what kind of thing were expected of you as a sports scientist working in a club that was challenging for Champions Leagues and, and Premier Leagues? Yeah, it's, it's making me feel a bit old, actually, there, Rob, <laughs> especially if I think about some of the technology, you know, I think we were very early on in utilising GPS, but they were these big, chunky devices, nothing compared to how they are now. I think they were probably one hertz as well. So very questionable data, I'm sure, <laughs> but part of the process. Um, yeah, I think it because it was more in its infancy then, obviously, player buy-in whereas perhaps now in certainly in football here it seems to be the norm that players attract they wear different technologies they have recovery available they get physical assessments and fitness tests um, that was all quite new which to some players is exciting and some players was a bit scary but you know i'm sure that's still the case today um, and a lot of the challenges we were facing again, still remain in football with changing philosophies, changing management. Um, and it obviously, as an intern as well, there was a lot of filling fridges and, and recovery shakes and putting out um, GPS and heart rate and collect, collecting sweaty uh, vests back in. But um, yeah, obviously, I was very fortunate at that time to be working under Nick, who um, for those that don't know, Nick Broad was um, a pioneering nutritionist and sports scientist who worked at Blackburn, Chelsea and PSG and unfortunately um, lost his life in a car crash, but had a massive impact on uh, our industry. And he was always questioning. He was always running around with his little laptop under his arm staying up late, diving into the data, um, seeking out people around the world, you know, Andrew Gray over in Australia, literally the other side of the world, and making that connection and trying to move things forward. So it's a lot of lessons that um, I learned from him in the two years we worked together early on that hopefully I've managed to take forward. And another thing, being a, being a woman at that time, and I said on the notes that I fired you over, you must have been the, one of the first in the Premier League to get a full-time job as a, as a sports scientist. Did you did you recognise that at the time? Or was it just you were integrated and Nick was doing his job and that was that was the end of it? Yeah, I I don't think I was that conscious of it, to be honest. Um, that 
that's going straight into that environment that's what I've known even studying at Loughborough I think there's quite a bit of a discrepancy um it's oversubscribed um in terms of interest from from uh male students um and so yeah I I'm again I'm fortunate I think that that Chelsea was welcoming um and uh, it didn't become an issue I mean I I I choose I choose not to go into the dressing rooms or the locker rooms other sometimes that's kind of is allowed but I just feel if I don't need to be in there which if it's just to collect some technology or something like that someone else can grab it for me now perhaps if I was a physio I that would be slightly different so to me it, it's not been an issue in terms of my day-to-day -day role um, and I obviously feel strongly that it's important to have diversity in your support staff both in terms of gender and in terms of race because of um, the diversity of thought that that can bring and how that helps to battle cognitive entrenchment thinking oh we've always done it this way and having very similar voices and backgrounds around you and again like I'm sure we'll get to my experience in the NFL whereby there was people from all kinds of backgrounds um, and 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 um, upbringings in that and I just loved and thrived in that diverse environment and learning and listening from everyone else that that topic there cognitive diversity has come up so much over the last probably six to twelve months Dan Lewindon Bryce Kavanagh Ben and, and Martin both at the FA it's come up more and more which is great and people recognizing that not only culturally but people who have done different stuff people who haven't just gone high school college sports science degree masters you know and just gone through that similar that same path who have gone to different countries who have been traveling for a year and got you know experience living and attending workshops and things in southeast asia or wherever it may be and that been a real value and i think that's for me that's so refreshing to hear that people are recognizing that and, and valuing it and taking it into account when employing people it's great yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's not it therefore it's not just a tick box exercise for the purpose of diversity there are genuine benefits to having um diverse staff and backgrounds in your setup and i think as well because we are serving uh, or supporting a playing group these individuals whether it's 25 people on a, a football uh, squad or it's 90 to 120 on an American football roster they have different personalities and they're going to connect with different individuals and I think if everyone in your support staff looks the same then you're only giving one dimension of people for your playing group to connect with whereas if you bring in that diversity not just in terms of the benefits of different life experiences but hopefully you're increasing that opportunity for people to connect with different people and have the different support systems that they need mm -hmm. just moving on chronologically why leave chelsea what, what was next yeah so well what i I guess a bit of context I didn't mention as well is that Chelsea is my team of from okay. birth. Um, so for me working at Chelsea, like that was literally the dream job. I wrote in my school leavers book in, um, well, I won't say the year because then people <laughs> that would date me. But I wrote when I was 18 that, you know, in 10 years time, I'll be a sports scientist at Chelsea Football Club. Okay. And so I was, I ticked that box. And what's next? And um, as I said, five or six years at Chelsea. So I was seeking this new challenge and I applied for uh, a sports scientist role with Brighton Hove Albion. And, um, uh, you know, not many people choose to leave Chelsea. People may, especially when it's your own team, people tend to try and stay there for quite a long time. And or um, unfortunately, a lot of people also get asked to leave at times. But um, so I think that kind of gained me a lot of respect and um, I'll always be very appreciative to that to the club but as I said I wanted a new challenge and Brighton was had 
obviously built their new stadium, brand new training ground, um, you know, local business businessman owner, very passionate about his team. And as we've come to see now, obviously doing well in the Premier League um, with managing to stay up and um, that was an exciting opportunity to kind of, again, just as with my differing experiences from academy to first team, now was the differing experiences of Premier League to Championship and trying to win promotion rather than perhaps, you know, trying to win the league or the Champions League. So was that a, a similar kind of level in role or was that a more senior role than at Chelsea? I'm just trying to get a bit of context because that's a really interesting move to go from, like you say, Champions yeah. League football to to the bottom half, bottom half of the championship. And that maybe looked down upon, like you say, people mm -hmm. wondering why, what's she doing? Like what's, what's the, what's the kind of career move? So I'm interested to see, yeah, hierarchy wise, where, where were you? Um, so it had senior in the title and I did have uh, a member of staff plus an intern reporting into me, but it was more the, uh, the appeal of uh, a blank canvas and the opportunity to build something um, more from scratch myself um, and, as I said, try and support a team that was more about um, can we can we progress this team to where the owner um, wants it to be? Um, so it, it was more about the project. I, th I think I've always been more driven by the project rather than the title. I mean, I've had pretty much the same title for uh, about 10 years, but, and I know other pe to other people that's important, but for me, it's, it's more the people and the project itself that um, attracts me to a role. So then Brighton comes to an end and the next opportunity comes up. How did that next opportunity come around? I mean, when people get these kind of roles and we're talking about the, the move to the US, it's always interesting because like you put, like we spoke about, it's often a sliding doors moment. It's often a conversation mm -hmm. that just happens by chance that then snowballs mm -hmm. into something happening six months, a year down the line. Is that, does that sound familiar? Is that how this, this that opportunity is... came around? Absolutely. That is literally how I often describe it, my sliding doors moment. So I was very happy at Brighton, um, wasn't necessarily looking. And then um, around a similar time, there was a, a couple of conversations I was reached out to by actually three different potential opportunities in the States. The one in Buffalo, um, so in... Uh, I'll tell the 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 backstory of the sliding sliding doors moment. Twenty twelve, I was still at Chelsea and I wanted to go backpacking in Australia uh, during the summer break, and um, it was meant to be a holiday and backpacking adventure. But obviously, going to Australia, I couldn't not try and visit teams and meet individuals and have conversations about sport. And um, I pretty much overstacked myself with such meetings and visits rather than relaxing. Um, and then one more came up and said, uh, you need to go for a coffee with Craig Duncan, who was at Sydney FC at the time. Great sports scientist, think you two would get on. And so, oh, okay, I'm, I told myself I wasn't going to book anymore, but let's, let's go for a coffee. Um, and we did, and we got on well. And um, I think it was not long after that, that Craig started working with ACU on this Masters of High Performance Sport and we stayed connected, reached out to me and said, I think that will be um, of interest to you. So 2014, I, I was part of the first cohort on this online distance learning Masters, which obviously now has, has gone from strength to strength and has also been a bit of a trailblazer in my opinion for now quite a few similar um, master's programs and online programs, which as we all know has been very important over the last year or so. Um, so I had to go back out in 2014 as part of that program. And, um, you know, one of the people that I met along the way there was someone who got reached out to about a, a possible sports science role with the Buffalo Sabres in ice hockey in, the, in America did they know of anyone? And they put me forward. 
Um, and so I always reflect and think, gosh, that one coffee in Sydney with Craig, if I hadn't gone for that, where would I be now? You know, and it it's true of so many different moments across life, of course. But um, that it was to me, that's been one of my big sliding doors moments. So uh, someone was um, the owners of the Sabres decided they wanted to try and put um, athletic support in the organization kind of developed that area and brought someone in to recruit staff um, across sports science strength and conditioning physiotherapy and as i said my my name got thrown into the hat and then so i ended up in buffalo which originally before i looked on the map i think i thought it was in texas just because of the buffalo the animal for some reason um and yeah had never um watched an ice hockey game knew nothing about the sport until that first evening that i arrived um in buffalo and watched they, the team were on the road so i watched their game on the tv in the hotel very um jet lagged and uh, nervous probably that's crazy one thing that i like to i'd like to ask is the person that put you forward did they know you as a person or did they know you as a person and had seen you interact with athletes, seen you in mm-hmm. the gym, seen you in in with your, you know, in the nine to five? Or did they put you forward just knowing you're a good person? They so I had actually had two people put me forward and both of whom I have not worked with day to day. I know in the industry. Um, as I said, one I met in Australia and um yeah, just stayed in contact with both of them and knew them from from various events and just through our industry. And, you know, I obviously can't speak about how well connected other industries are, but that is one thing that I love about our, our industry um, is the connection with people all over the world. I think generally speaking, people give up a lot of time. If you contact someone, drop them an email, um that you know that people are always willing to share experiences i mean your podcast is a brilliant example of that Mm, you've had what over 350 going on 400 podcasts where people come and share their lessons their stories um and so and i know the report you did um not that long ago you know so many roles are 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 achieved in our industry through who you know um which highlights the importance of net of networking and i say networking as a bit of a dirty word because i don't mean it in the sense of necessarily cold calling people and just networking for networking sake and trying to oh that person needs to know my name but genuinely trying to connect with people over social media conferences when you know they start up again um, experiences that you have um, and share some of you with them um, and you never know where it's going to lead you. I think it's it's not forcing it but it's putting yourself in organic positions for that thing that stuff to happen like yeah. going to the conference and just being being there putting yourself there and things happen yes. rather than thinking okay i've got to get i've got to get his number i've got to get her number i've got to have a chat with him like no just put yourself there and one thing i always say i don't know where i robbed it from but it sounds far too clever for me to make it up but be interested and be interesting and them two things i think are so important and that comes back to the whole cognitive diversity piece and being interesting enough to spark up a conversation and someone wants to actually spend half an hour with you an hour with you because you've got something to say you've got life experience you've you've just come back from a trip backpacking in australia where you met x person x person like that's a story that's a cool thing that people want to know about and the reason i asked about the do these people know who you are as a person or do they know as a practitioner because when people if people come to me and say do you know anyone that might be fit for this role well i haven't seen this person in practice but i know they're a really really good person and like that's 90, 95% of the way there. Like, unless they've done something horrendous in practice, mm-hmm. it's normally like you're not like you, you 
most of the way there because you're a good person. So I think that's, yeah, it's, it just rings true that that is actually happening as as well out there, in, again, in this opportunity with, with Buffalo. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I so I do some mentoring as well. And obviously, as students or graduates, they they they're often anxious about this process and they feel like well I'm I don't have anything interesting to say how can I go up to that person with 10 20 30 years of experience but I think like you say just showing an interest go up you know have a question in mind not just a tick box to get the conversation started what is the the research that they've done or what did they just present about or you know, what, where have they worked? And what is the one question you would really want to ask that person? Because then you're engaging them. And as I said, you ne- you never know where the conversation is going to go. Those, the people I've connected with who further down the line have put me forward for a role, those connections were, were natural and genuine. It was never with, oh, in the future, they might put me forward for something. So yeah, I think that's uh, really important for younger practitioners in our industry. Mm -hmm. absolutely and this brings me on nicely to what's going on now very exciting very exciting times we're back home like you said at the start yeah some new exciting projects coming up yeah so um five and a half years in buffalo which i think i went over there to do two and a half three or so years um and uh they kept me out there uh again (laughs) because of the project and the interest um but i i always thought I would feel ready to come home at some point. Um, I was very lucky to still feel connected to home during my time out there. Um, but also, um, I am venturing onto this um, performance science consultancy. What because there's a few reasons. Firstly, I'm seeking some variety. I feel like I know from the the fantastic experiences I've had working now across two continents, three major teams, um, obviously amazing experiences along the way. I know I can go into any team and be an applied sports scientist. I've done, I've done that. I know I can use scientific principles and make a difference to a team um, through that process. So what, what's the next challenge for me as, a, as I've said challenge a few times and often for people it's progressing within that club structure and becoming a performance director or a head of department and that doesn't really appeal to me because um, I, I think when you move into those roles it becomes about uh, management and it becomes a often about politics, which is fine, but you get away from your, your day job and your, what, what your practitioner role a lot of the time. And I, not that long ago, Lachlan Penfold you had on, and he was talking about Mm. uh, grappling with the change of, in his identity, going from, you know, strength and conditioning coach into a performance director, because you're no longer a strength and conditioning coach. So for me, I am really passionate about using scientific principles to enhance performance. And I want to try and do that more broadly across our industry. Um, And whether that is delivering performance solutions with teams, um, auditing the services that they provide, working with uh, younger practitioners and trying to develop, um, you know, those those individuals, um, this is what I feel really passionate about doing for my next challenge. It's, it's so interesting because it's come up so many times with the two Lacklands, Lackland Penfold, Lackland Wilmot. Um, it came up recently with Angus Ross over in New Zealand. And he did a, he went from performance coach, I think it was strength and conditioning coach's title, got to a management position and then did a U-turn and was like, nah, I'm not interested in doing that because he was behind a laptop and doing more admin. Mm. Again, dealing with politics, dealing with management. Did a U-turn, dropped back down, and now he's doing back doing what he um, what he loves, which is being on the on the track and in the gym with athletes. And it's I think it's the same in lots of different industries. You're a good salesperson, 
you do selling, you go meet people, you, you're yeah. good at that job, and then you become a manager. You don't do any selling, you're looking after the people that sell. And it's like, you know, which one do you want to do? And I think it does seem to be a natural progression for people, mm -hmm. but it's always difficult, that transition to not doing what you've actually been really good at and why you got yourself there in the first place. So I do, I do find that transition interesting. It's even more interesting that you've gone, no, 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 I, I'm happy doing this because I'm really passionate about it. I'm going to go here and pitch myself here because that's where I can really add value. That's great. Sounds sounds super exciting. It, yeah, it, it's, it, it, it was a big decision. Obviously, it was a big decision. And um, I, I, I can't speak more highly about my time at the Buffalo Bills as well because that, that experience was phenomenal. And to be part of an organization that is so forward thinking, inclusive, is going in the right direction, obviously hasn't quite reached the peaks that we, or they want to just yet. And so to, tur to turn my back as well at that moment and say, you know, I really, really hope that you guys are gonna go continue to go on to bigger and brighter things. Um, but I, I, this is this is my path now. Um, it, it was a big decision, but I, I really um, believe strongly in living via your values and reflecting on what you really want. And um, it is, like you said, that treadmill of like, well, I'll, I'll progress to head of and then director of and people get swept up in it, perhaps. Others, you know, definitely love it and they thrive in that that situation, but um, and I'm also open to the the fact that it might not be forever. I might do this for a few years and be like, you know, now I'm ready to go back into team sports full time. I miss the camaraderie. I miss that competition, the high pressure. I, I'm aware of that, and I had that conversation recently with Robin Thorpe, who I know has been on um, recently, and obviously has gone a similar path as well. Yeah. And we both agreed, like nothing is forever and i i never envisaged or planned that i would go from football to ice hockey to american football you know so um but life is about experiences and so this is a new new experience that uh, that i want to have and hopefully um, bring value to our industry in doing so and i'm absolutely positive that you will it sounds super super exciting let's have a little chat around the lessons learned from all these different places that you've been and, and please tell me if i'm com if i'm wrong but i'm not aware of anyone that's worked in british the the top end of the british football pyramid and then worked in the nfl and then just in between worked in ice hockey yeah. so it's a it's a really really unique path that you've had and it's it's, mm. it's great but what have you what are the biggest learnings from all these different environments what works and what doesn't work well, I have to quickly mention my boss, uh, Joe Collins, there because he would be another one who uh, okay. he, he he's a he stays under the radar, but he's the performance director basically of the Bills and the Sabers. He still yeah. does both teams, um, but is British and came through, um, spent his time in football, worked for Spurs, Palace as well, I think, and then was head of medical at Saracens. So. Thankfully, I did have an ally and uh, it was quite easy for everyone because Joe and Joe with the uh, the funny accents <laughs> is pretty easy for everyone to remember. Um, lessons learned. Uh, I've learned how to drive on the right side of the road in an automatic <laughs> and now I'm having to learn to drive uh, manual on the left hand side of the road again. Um, no, I, I think, I mean, I joke about it, but some of those personal challenges were the things I didn't even think about going over there. Um, I remember the first time I tried to fill my car up with petrol out there, I couldn't work out where to do it. And then I tried <laughs> to use the machine too many times and I had to drive away from a gas station, of course, without having filled the car up. So, you know, little things like that going to the supermarket and every all the brands are different and where things are stored is different so i don't i think uh the life challenges as well was was a big part of it um on the work side i think um having a, a beginner's mind um 
and and one of the reasons you're being brought in is because you 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 are a beginner in that environment but it is natural i think to um to cling on to what you know so in my case from football i you feel like you need to bring in what you know from there and that and you make assumptions that aren't true i remember the first time i um measured um skin folds um with the hockey players ice hockey players um i remember looking at some of the guys and thinking that they had like a lot of fat mass around their their stomach around their abdominals and then when i came to measure that abdominal site they were really lean and it was a function of their pelvis being so tilted because of the skating action the ice skating action obviously and you have to remember a lot of these guys were maybe even ice skating before they could walk <laughs> and so they even move almost more naturally on the ice than on land so their bodies have adapted to that demand and that was the first example to me of like oh i've been used to footballers and that was an assumption that i had which now that that highlights that I'm dealing with a different population here. Um, so again, another example of um, learning lessons from working with different groups, whether it's ages, sports, um, genders, what have you. Um, and, and because of that, I think like what I describe as transplant systems, they don't work. You can't pick up what you were doing elsewhere and bring it here and i think often when people get the opportunity and this is just to go into maybe a, a different role anyway but it's particularly as exacerbated when you go to a different sport and a different country and perhaps all of that together well i'm being brought in to to bring what i did there here and um, perhaps some people have not been successful with that mindset because there is so much context to understand and you have to respect the culture and you have to learn from the people there that know the sport and so i think one of the biggest lessons was was being patient because again you go in and you feel under pressure to have an impact and make a difference um, but actually the first, the first few, maybe the first six months or, or however long is all about listening, building relationships and, and learning from them first and foremost, to a point where then they'll turn around and say, oh, what do you think about this? Or perhaps you'll then get the opportunity to present. I, you know, I don't think I really I sat down with a coach until you know, four or so months in, and we didn't change anything for the a long time. And I was again listening to, I think his name is Rick from Feyenoord, saying about yes. his first um, six months or a year, he just was trying to learn the terminology. Mm -hmm. And like, I completely agree with that. And it's a battle because you feel under pressure to 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 have an impact to make a change but you can't do that without relationships you have to build those relationships first in order to leverage change so how did you begin to understand the sport and i've been thinking about this today knowing that we were going to have this chat and it took me back to a little story that i had at, at doncaster when i when i first started there and as you'll know when you're on the grass with the players you'd like a I don't know, return to play or something like that. The person that can pass a ball and trap a ball is the one that gets sent out with the players. Or you can mm. you can do long passing, so out you go. And I, no one kind of knew my little bit of playing background. And I went out and I had one player who thought I'll be a bit clever and like wrapped it in, wrapped the pass in, and mm -hmm. I trapped, trapped it, it, controlled it, and passed it back. <laughs> and that, that instantly was like my respect his respect for me you could instantly see it go up mm. and then it kind of got around that i was actually still playing semi-pro at the time and then it got to a point where lads would come into me and go 
I've got this clip. What would you do there? And I'm like, that's not like, that's not my, <laughs> that's not my place, but I'm happy to tell you my opinion. So it was instantly just from that, like understanding the game instantly, my respect, their respect for me went up. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that people should be like, be able to do perfect long passes and things like that, but just having an understanding and respect for the game gets respect from the players. I'm just Absolutely. wondering how you did that. Yeah, because I can't uh, stop on a pence uh, on ice skates exactly, and I can't exactly. <laughs> throw a, a, an American football very well. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I had to be um, honest and humble and take even more interest. You know, it, it almost helped in the sense that there was no hiding my ignorance. And I embraced that and set out to learn as much as I could from the the players and the staff. So one of one of the um, teams I worked for, one of the equipment managers, you know, here we'd say a kit man, but in those sports said more so dealing with equipment. Um, he'd worked for the team the whole time that they had existed. So he worked with every single player. He'd worked, you know, at every single season. And obviously people were very um, unsure about all the foreigners coming into their environment. And again, if you try and jump in and make changes, then they're going to close off to you. But if you, if you sit there and you listen, tell me your stories, um, then you start to build a relationship and then that person thinks oh they're, they're interested in me and and the same goes with the playing group and we uh joe and i's office um it was both kind of physically and figuratively in between the weight room and the training room which is the medical room in america and um so it was a real like a thoroughfare like a real walkthrough mm -hmm. and we had a, a sofa a couch i have to pick <laughs> which language i'm speaking in, um in there and the players would sit down and chat with us and whether it, it was terrible for productivity but obviously it was it was the most important thing and whether it was talking about the royal family as i was often the the correspondent of <laughs> for the royal family in in buffalo or learning about their their upbringing or how it works how the sport works you know it's all a vehicle then to understanding the game so i think just that humility and honesty but the interest it all comes down to people skills doesn't it rob i mean mm -hmm. it it's probably a, a broken record but that's because it's true and yeah. unless you connect with people um I, I feel like as a sports scientist, okay, it is important to uh, do be evidence-based, do your due diligence, know the research, uh, disseminate the research, relate it to your, to your sport and what it means for your environment. That's our day job. But none of that matters unless you are connected to the, the staff and the playing group around you. It's it's so interesting that you mentioned and you mentioned the kit man, because I'm I'm well I'm not determined but I'm I'm pretty sure that around about fifty fifty five I'm going to become a kit man. <laughs> I just it just yeah the, the heartbeat of the club. Yeah. Like you say that the people that the guy that you mentioned or, or girl I'm not quite sure what it was but um the equipment manager been there since the beginning of the organisation. If you can get in with him, you're guaranteed you'll be all right. And it's the same at all clubs. These kit men who've been there for 20, 25 years, who know the club inside out, have so much influence on the mood, on how mm -hmm. things run that day. If he's miserable, everyone's miserable. Yeah. And like passing little little messages, managers mentioned this to me, I'm not quite sure if that this might be of help to you and all this kind of thing. So crucial, them real cornerstone positions in organizations. And I think Absolutely. as new members of staff, identifying who they, those people are it might be the cook or the chef. Oh, like yeah. They see, Take they care see of the every, food people, yeah. Uh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> the kit man, the cook, the chef, um, the cleaners who will see things and be around people a lot. Identify them 
and get to know them, get on the get on the right level with them, like speak to them how you'd speak to everyone else, and you you know you're you're a long way there. Yeah, I, I I cannot agree with you more, Rob. And I think a lot of my role at the Bills was that it was con- connecting with all the different parts of the building, which you know I don't sit down and plan it. It's I'm it's part of my personality. I like to know everyone's names, which is a lot of people's names in an NFL building. Um, and I like love to connect with people, but it also helps my role by knowing um, all those different departments. And it's about understanding the flow of information and where sometimes that communication breaks down and knowing people's processes. For, so for instance, Take, if you have an athletic trainer, which is kind of like a physios in the medical room in, in the US, um, you know, and you I remember they seeing that when you get a, a trainee or a, a, f- a free agent trial in, they're scouring the internet trying to find their some information on their injury history through public sources. But then I've also spent time with the director of analytics and I, I know that department, I know what they're working on and I go, well, hold on a minute because I know that he has this system that collects all of that. So let me connect you guys and 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 maybe we can save some time here and we have a m- much more efficient system. Now, something like that, that's not written on my job description as a sports scientist. and. It's not a technical skill about determining whether or not I should use the acute chronic workload ratio or I should use mean or peak power for my jump testing. But I would argue that has had, you know, potentially a bigger impact on the organization um, in terms of helping my colleagues and helping the systems so that we can be more efficient and information can flow more effectively. It is. I mean, like you said at the start, it's, it sounds like a broken record, but it's not because it's just so true. And I think, is it in built in people? Can that kind of thing be learned? I'm sure it can be learned, like 100%. Um, but I think a lot of it is in people's characters, people's personalities, which is why the likes of David Slemon, who came on this this podcast six months ago, nine months ago, talked so much about that from a recruitment point of view mm. and getting to know that personality. The, there's, what did he say? There's nine, there was nine key themes that ran through every recruitment process and only three of them were technical. All the rest were, well, non-technical qualities. So that just, you know, shouts so loud that all this mm. is just, incredibly important yes the three have got to be there of course they have like non-negotiable but them six are just so important i don't think it can be yeah there's no need to apologize for kind of ramming that home because it is it is so important yeah i listened to that episode twice actually because it was so brilliant and i one of i think he said cultural fit is the person a cultural fit and i think that is that just sums it up yes you need to be a good practitioner if you're a sports scientist, you need to understand data, transforming it into information. You need to understand um, synthesizing the research into what it means in your environment. Um, but if you cannot transition into a particular culture and bring some energy, personality, and be someone that staff and players want to have within their team, then then you you won't get anywhere without those those kinds of skills. So yeah, I, I I don't think we can emphasize it enough. And I think that that cultural fit, it maybe in some people means that you're getting the same kind of people into the organisation that are already there. And I don't think that's I don't that could be probably a misconception of that of that mm. term. But that's definitely not the case, and that's definitely not what. No. David was explaining again and again it comes across that cognitive diversity what do you actually need what kind of person do you need again a lot of um, psychological profiling going on whether it be insights or other Mm. other ways people do it have we got loads of reds like do we need another red do we need another kind of get in there get it done and leave kind of person or do we need someone who's a little bit more I think it's yellow a bit more happy Mm a bit more 
like wanting to be friends with people, take a little bit more time with things. So yeah, just to kind of ram that home that cultural fit doesn't mean just more people of the same kind of personality. No, and I think it links as well with awareness of how much um, our own behaviours can affect players and therefore can affect performance. So it's about having that emotional intelligence because you are um, often a mouthpiece for the culture and for the head coach, particularly in like in, in the NFL, it's everything is so big, right? The number of players, the building. Um, and so you have to be aware of your own messaging and your own behavior in terms of lifting people's energy and, and supporting those players and uh, reinforcing um, positivity and confidence in them. Absolutely, 100%. Again, that's the, the kit. I'm just coming back to them cornerstone members of staff, like the kit man. Then, yeah, the, yeah and, and that, like we're talking about sports science staff, whatever it may be, set the tone for the day. Your yes. bubbly, your buzzing. I mean, we used to have um, assistant manager Mickey Lewis, and he was at Oxford and a couple of other places. As soon as you got on the field, big clap, and it like energy went up. He was buzzing and just, just lifted it every single day. But yeah, super, super important. But what I'd like to ask you, any specific challenges that you came across, either it, the, the Sabres or the Bills, and on reflection, would you have done anything different when the challenges were faced? Um, oh, good question. I think, um, I mean, you only live your life in forwards, right? So... Mm -hmm. um, everything I learned, particularly early on transitioning to a new sport and a new country, I think I needed to go through that and learn. So I don't think I would change anything, but I think I would think about if I was to go again, or, or perhaps my advice for um, others going into that environment from my own lessons would be around, um, I mean, I've already talked about being patient, building relationships, but I think also um, understanding the expectations of the organization that's bringing you in um, is really important, uh, especially if it's a new role. Um, do they understand what that role entails and what are they expecting as their outcome of it? So are they expecting oh we'll bring sports scientists in that means we're gonna win the championship within a couple of years do they understand and you know it will be the person's role to help explain to them what the role is what benefits it will bring and make sure you have aligned expectations of what it's going to look like and then with that in place, I think the actual integration and introduction of new staff members, particularly one with funny accents, <laughs> is really important. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, uh, the Sabres early on, it was challenging. The, the project was very exciting and the intentions were right in trying to bring you know, really forward thinking um, group of people in. But I think it was maybe like a little bit overwhelming, perhaps too much too soon. Like I arrived, for instance, in the November and some staff arrived in the September and there was just like, and some staff in the October. So it was like constant trickle. And I can imagine as a player in, in that within a season, that's quite off-putting perhaps um, and again it none of that was deliberate but I think having that um, intentional planning around integrating staff um, is uh, something I would recommend others to look out for if they're going through a similar experience and that ties nicely back in with the consultancy stuff as we've spoken about expect it clear expectations of what the um, employer, um, so to speak, wants and, and thinks they're going to get. And that's definitely from my experience, something that I didn't 
do early on and have probably never done particularly well and just been super excited to get in and you kind of get in and go, this isn't, I don't think anyone's super sure what I'm actually bringing here. So yeah, mm. I think any any type of environment, whether it's a consultancy role or a permanent role, just having that real clarity and that been reviewed in a, an appraisal. And that's why these kind of things are, are, are so important and and do maybe get a bit boring Unless it's, a, unless it's a salary discussion, I'm not particularly bothered, but they can be super, super important for, for that kind of stuff as well, especially going to a new country, new role, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, we, we have discussed it because having that alignment means hopefully that both parties are going to be happy. Right. Absolutely. And so absolutely now going forward for me is uh, articulating the value that I bring which is based on the very unique experiences that I've had um, and, and the lessons along the way, but also having the perspe perspective from an external viewpoint, because as we all know, um, you know, all practitioners are uh, on that treadmill, highly pressurized, you're not, you're concerned about winning at the weekend or what have you, organisations are concerned about um, keeping their, their assets on the field and therefore giving their team the best chance to succeed and therefore minimising loss of uh, earnings through whether underperformance or, or injury. And so these are challenges that are faced by organisations and individuals in our industry and I'm I'm describing myself as like an external teammate because I think having someone that's uh, separated from the cold face that has is not involved in the politics day to day but also understands the politics and the culture of that environment can be a, a beneficial resource. And why do, why do CEOs have? coaches personal coaches i mean we spoke openly with i spoke openly with bryce about it because he has someone external that he goes to just for catch-up advice just to bounce ideas off just an external voice that like you say is removed from the politics just give it gives a um a relatively objective view of of the the situation and without being clouded in everything that's going on so it makes complete sense that that would be the same with a performance department. Yeah, yeah, we, we, all, we all benefit from coaches, right? Like, yeah. not just athletes, we need to shift away from that traditional mindset of just, you know, your technical coaches and your athletes. We're all performers. And I think this is, this is something, a new frontier that I'm also really interested in is um, not just sports science, is performance science. Because yes, I am passionate about sport, and and I I feel very passionately that scientific principles can support athletic performance. But surgeons are performers, you know. Um, politicians even are performers. Chefs, and I think that our industry has an opportunity to expand its remit in terms of supporting those performers because many of the same principles remain. And that's where it gets really exciting. And that's where I touched on with Robin a little bit. But yeah, I mean, we didn't go into that kind of detail with them kind of industries and that's great to hear. And I think should put people's ears up when they hear that kind of thing coming from someone like you who've you know been in environments that you've been in and that that's the view that you hold. So I think that's, wow, that, that's super exciting. And it's for us to take that opportunity and be good at articulating how we can potentially help these kind of people. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's for our own benefit as well in terms of our learning ourselves. I, le I learned so much from going to different teams, different sports, different environments. I became a much better practitioner, but I also developed so much as a person from putting myself in those different environments. So yes, I hope to bring um, benefits to, you know, other industries through performance support, but I'm, I have no doubt that I will gain back from, well, how does a surgeon learn during an operation or how do they adapt when something's going wrong? 
And so um, hopefully it will be very much symbiotic relationships. And I think we, we are going that way. There's, as soon as you said surgeon, I think checklist manifesto, the Atul Gawande book. Yeah. So you're instantly learning from what, well, he learned from all these different uh, industries, pilots, surgeons about the basic use of checklists yeah. and that, yeah, that that's, yeah, super exciting, very exciting. But just, just bringing it back to the sports science. And again, this has come up a couple of times, especially with Brits that have gone to the States or people that have, that have moved, moved countries. What is sports science? And is there a, and this is only my perception that there seems to be a slight confusion of what that actually looks like. Is it just, I know the, I already know the answer of course, but I think, is it just a GPS guy or girl? And I think that's sometimes the tag that sports scientists do get, not, not internally, but from the wider organization, from, from players or from coaches, uh, an S and C coach, you're just a gym guy, like, but bring it back to the sports science. What is sports science? And is this, does this confusion still exist, especially in the U S I think it's a complicated question because sports, so I'm not going to answer it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, it's a complicated question because sports science is a broad term. Sports science is just the application of scientific principles to assist with sports performance. And so actually, so many practitioners and parts of an organization are influenced by sports scientists or influenced by sports science. So obviously strength and conditioning coaches, nutrition, medical staff, doctors, and I would eat, I would argue like technical coaches as well, whether it's football or American football, they are observing, they are almost experimenting. And so I think because it it's, that's why it will always be a complicated thing because it's such a broad term. And, and now, yes, I, I, I have concerns that often so-and-so does sports science means that they download the GPS. Um, and it, it shouldn't mean that. I, I obviously believe that there is a real benefit of having an applied sports scientist role, like a specialist in role there for someone. But there are many routes to being a sports scientist. And I, I think that there are opportunities for all, all these different practitioners to become even more versed in, in scientific principles. Because as I said, physiotherapists or athletic trainers are using scientific principles to drive their practice. And so I, I have a, a paper under review at the moment that's trying to articulate that um, these, this skill set can be developed or already exists in a lot of different practitioners. It's about thinking with uncertainty and doubt, like that's at the core of science and trying to explore and collect findings that either may support or dismiss that hypothesis. It's about updating your beliefs when new evidence arises. It's about trying to learn from the research, which may be papers and, you know, in a pure sense is the literature, but also your own experiences. And so I think confusion does exist. And I don't think it is as straightforward as I don't think there's a simple kind of solution, but I think we just need continue, continued discussions around um, what the skill sets are and, and what the kind of roles are. So, for instance, I, if I, I've tried to develop colleagues that I've worked with and upskill them in the kind of scientific thinking, I would never want to just teach someone how to download GPS or run a force platform or you know just basic instructions like that i want to invest in them to explain why i'm doing what i'm doing what do they think about it what the science says what the art says what are the limitations to this methodology um, and what the future might look like and hopefully then 
rather than just knowing how to uh, manage the technology or or ha or make the recovery shakes or whatever form of intervention it might be they're developing their own scientific mindset along the way how important and this came up this came up with the a, on a, the chat with robin but how important is it that you keep this thread of research academia through your through your practice through your life i suppose because you've mentioned a paper review you've obviously done research on an ongoing basis how important is that for you as a person but also a practitioner well the problem or the beauty of science however you want to look at it is it's never done it's always evolving that is literally what science is you can never complete science and therefore um you <clears throat> it's important to to stay in touch with the updates um, in through research as i said updating your beliefs when new evidence presents itself is at the core of, of science and so yes to me personally because i know that growth and learning again that's one of my core values and so i think perhaps my whether it's how my brain is wired or what I've come to love. But yes, that's a really important thing for me anyway. And that's why, you know, I've written, I have written on a blog for so many years and try to get peer review papers published and read both within the sports medicine and science literature, but also read, you know, broadly as well, because um, I, it is without doubt an integral part of of being a scientist you mentioned the blog there and i missed that at the start i was going to bring it up at the start but i think that's a nice time to bring it back how important has that been for you and i know you mentioned about the academia and the research being slow but a blog super super fast you can write that and get it out within a click of a you know click of a mouse mm -hmm. how important has that been for you to get your thoughts on on paper and be able to publish that get feedback and really get involved in that that short feedback loop process? Yeah, honestly, I never realized how much it would give to me when I started out doing it. So I will say as well that the blog was originally set up in Nick's memory um, a year or two after he passed away by um, David Penny and Johnny Bloomfield, who were two consultants who we'd work, had worked with Nick at Chelsea and we'd all worked together. And um, so it was born out of obviously uh, an important purpose. And then for me, it has just been first and foremost, a vehicle to try and improve my writing skills, which again is another constant uh, ongoing quest. And, um, but also an opportunity to synthesize my thoughts and you know if if no one was to read it then it would each article would still have been of great benefit to me personally um and then on the other but on the other side of it the benefits brought me from my network and growing kind of uh i'll often meet people who have or, or talk to people who said oh i read that of yours or which is incredible i never thought mm. people in far off corners of the world would be reading just a little blog i wrote about something because i wanted to concentrate on that topic for a bit and try and and summarize my views um and again it was never set out to do that and and there is a thin line between um uh not seeking external validation and i'm sure that's a perhaps a battle you have as well with how much <laughs> social media yeah. and your podcast everything is quantified through yeah. views and likes and retweets um so i constantly try to remind myself why i'm doing it um for me first and foremost and then the other benefits are bonuses yeah I would definitely echo that. And it's something that you can easily get roped into, especially when you, you put yourself out there in such a, whether it be a long form article or come on a podcast. And, you know, people do now contact me and say, how many downloads did I get? Not from a personal point of view, her pat on the back, but 
because that can go towards um, numbers uh, for, for a job if you're at university. Okay, how, how are we disseminating the information that we produce mm -hmm. at this university? And the download figures go towards that. So it's not only oh, wow. influencing them in terms of a, a pat on the back, but that's potentially going towards them getting another tick in a box when it comes to keeping a job or getting a promotion or whatever that may be. And it's all been university staff, um, uh, just to make that super, super clear. But yeah, everything's quantifiable and it's easy to get sucked into that world of social media and external gratification. Mm. And it's a dark place to be. <laughs> it's a dark place to be, yeah. Well, it, that is, is how we're wired, right? So we can't mm. turn it off again. That is a constant, uh, be, I think being aware and reflecting on it and and one of the things i do i try to do is kind of think reflect before on why i'm doing something and then reflect after as well so just reminding myself of of the internal motivation and then the benefits that i took from it um but yeah it's it's that's always going to be a battle and probably maybe we'll get even more intense as society continues to yeah. evolve and just to wrap that little bit up, you mentioned self-awareness and going back to the episode with David, that was one that he said was potentially the most important characteristics of a potential candidate was self-awareness. So just finish that, we'll finish that in. there. Yeah, <laughs> so absolutely. But just one thing I wanted to touch on before I let you go. 2018 paper, Developing Cost Effective Load Monitoring System. And I went on ResearchGate to revisit that. I don't know. It's had loads of reads so i just wanted to touch on that to see going back to this process of re-evaluation and keeping up to date with the the research and and also your development as a practitioner based on that paper which clearly resonated with a lot of people and was highly valuable has anything changed with your views on exactly that developing a cost-effective load management system um, I think, well, to give the background first and foremost, that was born out of, um, I visited a college in the States and um, their soccer program, I think it was their girls soccer program, and they were, you know, tiny budget, um, two, maybe three members of staff, really limited time um, resources, no... Uh, they were technical coaches, so no real uh, specific scientific knowledge in that area. Um, and yet they'd spent their whole budget on getting GPS technology. And I was asking them politely, why, how are they going to use it? And it kind of struck me that that is like the go to, perhaps that is a go to expense. And are, are we doing everything beforehand from a cost effective perspective to put systems in place before we then uh, spend m money on a technology? Um, and it's not just GPS, obviously, there's other technologies that would be considered in that as well. And I, I so that that's where it was born out of. And I think that remains the same. And maybe it's even more, more intense so. now. Yeah, yeah because of yeah you know, how sports technology has exploded and the pressures to kind of keep up with others. Um, but I, I think like subjective information, first and foremost, is the cornerstone. And what, why would you spend money on external load monitoring when perhaps you're not asking your players that the RPE or wellness? Now, there are pros and cons to those methods. And if you have a reason a justification for not doing it okay and if you have a justification for how you're going to use the the technology that you want to spend the money on then that's great but again it comes back to the why um and i i still it has its faults you know those kinds of cheap subjective information but given that we've said the most important thing is relationships and communication then it does make sense that the players telling us one how hard they thought training was and two how they're feeling in terms of wellness or sleep or or muscle soreness um despite its limitations i think it's very valuable information 
I think it's very valuable information at the highest level with the biggest resources and therefore in, in programs that do not have the same uh, resources and are limited by their budgets and their uh, staff, um, you know, people that are there to manage that information, then, then I think it's um, definitely worthwhile consideration. So was that, was that kind of data high up the pyramid when you were in the States in terms of valuable information that you were collecting load monitoring wise? In terms of like the subjective information? Yeah, sorry, in terms of subjective, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I mean, I, I really value that information. And again, yes, you get issues with how to collect it. Yes, you get conformity issues if so-and-so over here is someone else saying what their RP is. Yes, with the wellness, you get some guys that just put the same thing every day. But the guys who don't, then the the athletes who who do give uh, more honest information, then it's a jumping off point for conversation. Um, and I just think it's such a um, non-invasive, it, as long as you can manage the integration of it in the right way, so it's not adding to the burden on the athlete, um, and you can educate them as to why you're doing it, then, um, I almost think it's, why wouldn't you? And if, whether you've got a million pound budget or a budget of a pound, I, th I definitely recommend people going and, and having a little read of that 2018 paper. But Joe, where can people get in touch with you if they've got any questions based on what we've, what we've discussed for the last hour and a bit, which has flown, by the way? <laughs> Love it. It has. Where, where can, it has. Where can, where, can, where can people find out more about you? What's going on? social media wise, etc. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, um, at Joe Club Sports I. Um, if people want to email me, they can do so um, at joe.club at acu.edu.au. That's um, one of the Australian universities I'm involved with. And um, also, I have a website which is globalperformanceinsights.com and uh, there's a contact form on there as well. Globalperformanceinsights.com Global Performance Insights, yeah. Love it. Excellent. Well, I'm going to let you go, but thank you very, very much for coming on. It's great to finally uh, have a catch up and, and, and record it. But yeah, thank you very much and we'll, we'll catch up soon. Good luck with whatever's you know, all the plans that you've got and um, I'm sure you'll do absolutely amazing.